Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, today, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Nasser. Uh, Dr. Nasser did his internal medicine residency at the University of Iowa, where he stayed to do a pulmonology and critical care fellowship, and uh, he now is a clinical professor of medicine uh, in uh, the Department of Pulmonology and Critical Care at the University of Iowa. Uh, he very graciously has accepted our uh, invitation today uh, to uh, provide us with a review of sepsis, and uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Nasser. Thank you, Thanks. thank you very much for having me. So uh, over the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna go over uh, sepsis. And um, uh, I'm a, an intensivist. I work mostly in the medical ICU. So sepsis is something that I see, you know, invariably every day. Uh, I have uh, no conflicts of interest that are relevant to my talk today. And the things I'm gonna uh, cover over the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna define sepsis and septic shock, and then I'm gonna go over the various components of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. And this is based on the most recent uh, uh, publication from the uh, campaign back in 2021. I'm gonna focus on four different aspects of uh, sepsis management, including the role of lactic acid, fluid therapy, vasoactive therapy, and then antibiotics. Uh, the most recent uh, version of the sepsis definition was uh, published in 2016. This is uh, version 3.0. And um, sepsis is uh, defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction that's caused by a dysregulated host response to an infection. There are two main aspects of that definition. One is organ dysfunction, and the second thing is infection. Organ dysfunction is assessed using uh, the SOFA score. SOFA score is a sequential organ failure assessment, and I'm going to have a slide on that in a little bit. And any change in that SOFA score of two points or more um, uh, signals organ dysfunction. Now, septic shock, on the other hand, is a subset of sepsis in which the underlying circulatory, cellular, and metabolic abnormalities uh, are profound enough to increase the mortality to over 40%. Uh, this is defined when the serum lactate is above two, a uh, patient uh, has hypotension requiring vasopressors to maintain a mean arterial pressure of above 65, and this is in the absence of hypovolemia. Now, you might recall um, a severe sepsis uh, was part of the definition, but is, that's no longer the case, and that's because Sepsis by itself has a, a mortality of around 10%. Septic shock has a mortality of over 40%. Severe sepsis is somewhere in between. But in fact, even sepsis by itself with a mortality of 10% uh, is, uh, is pretty high. So severe sepsis uh, is no longer part of the definition. It's either the patient has sepsis or septic shock with the recognition that septic shock has a much higher mortality compared to sepsis. As I mentioned, the first thing is organ dysfunction. Organ dysfunction is defined using the sequential organ failure assessment. Uh, this, is, uh, this score is made up of organ dysfunction. Uh, actually, these are the six major organs, so pulmonary coagulation, liver, cardiovascular, CNS, and renal. And then depending on the degree of dysfunction of each organ, the patient gets a score. The score goes from zero, if the function is normal, up to four. And... Um, so, uh, you know, these are measured and, and calculated. However, it's actually hard uh, to have that score if your patient is, uh, is not uh, in, the, uh, in the ICU. So instead, what is oftentimes used is the Q SOFA score or the quick um, SOFA score, uh, which is used for patients outside of the ICU. And this is uh, encephalopathy, so glasocoma scale of less than 15, systolic blood pressure of less than 100, uh, and the patient uh, becoming tachypneic with a respiratory rate of 22 or more. So having two of these criteria is a pretty good reflection of the, you know, the general uh, SOFA score and can be used uh, instead. Now, the second part of the definition is, um, is an infection. So this is based on clinical suspicion or uh, microdata or radiographic data. It's important to uh, just be aware that a third of the patients that we initially diagnosed with sepsis turned out to have non-infectious conditions. So they don't have sepsis. It could be vasculitis, pancreatitis, or, or others. Uh, 
and about 80% of the hospital treated uh, sepsis cases that, that you see um, uh, is going to be coming from the community. So it's important to know uh, what's the prevalence of organisms in, the, in our communities. I'm just showing you the slide, I realize it's busy. The, the middle part, which is in red, is uh, the distribution uh, size of infection and microorganisms in North America. There's actually variability uh, between North America and uh, South America or, uh, uh, or even uh, Europe. However, as far as we're concerned, gram positives and gram negatives almost are equal as far as prevalence, so around 50% each for gram negatives. Oftentimes, uh, the most common ones are going to be E. coli, uh, Pseudomonas, and Klebsiella. There's more recent data that shows that gram positive are becoming a little bit, uh, you know, more prevalent because of procedures, lines, and hardware that we're using uh, in some of our patients. So it's important to know the definition and just to think of, you know, uh, infection and organ dysfunction because we need to have a low threshold to diagnose sepsis. We need to identify sepsis or septic shock early, and we need to think of sepsis as being a medical emergency. Just as we think of angiography for STEMI, uh, we should think of uh, initiating uh, treatment for septic shock uh, for our patients as well. So that includes early initiation of uh, antibiotics, uh, fluid resuscitation, and then if uh, the patient is not responding, then thinking of advanced uh, interventions uh, for uh, organ, organ support. So that takes me to the uh, second kind of part of, the, of, of my talk, which is talking about the different uh, arms and, uh, you know, managing these patients. Um, sure you're familiar with the three and six hour uh, bundle from the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. The three hour bundle includes measuring uh, lactate, obtaining cultures before starting antibiotics, and then administering broad-spectrum antibiotics, again, depending on the local prevalence, and then uh, infusing 30 mLs per kilogram of fluids for hypotension or a lactate above uh, four. Now, the six-hour bundle um, includes studying vasopressors uh, for hypotension that's not responding to the initial fluid resuscitation, and again, maintaining a map of 65, targeting CVP and SCVO2, and then remeasuring the lactate. Now, CMS uh, uh, took that a step further. What they did is they, they came up with the SEP1, which is they combined the three and the six hour uh, bundle, and they uh, you know combined it into a one hour uh, bundle. So this is the SEP1. And uh, the step one doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to have to be accomplished in the first hour, in, in the first hour. Actually, it cannot be accomplished in the first hour, but it has to be initiated in the first hour. So what you want to try and achieve in the first hour is measure lactate level and then remeasure if the initial lactate is uh, greater than two obtaining cultures before administering antibiotics and then administering antibiotics, uh, fluids, uh, 30 mL per kilogram for hypotension or a lactate more than four, and then starting vasopressors if the patient is hypotensive uh, during or after fluid resuscitation to maintain a map of 65. I really like that distinction of during or after because oftentimes we think of fluids, 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 and then starting vasopressors, but there's more recent data that shows that maybe early vasopressors uh, is helpful as well. And I'm going to talk about uh, talk about that at the end of my talk uh, as well. So, um, as I said, I'm going to try and kind of divide these uh, different arms of the surviving sepsis campaign. And the first thing is talking about lactate levels. Now, we know that uh, lactate uh, is a good prognostic uh, element. Showing you here a study that uh, looked at uh, over over a thousand patients and they looked at the initial lactate level. This is on the x-axis, on the y-axis is the mortality. And then they looked at mortality um, in uh, three days or less, which is the gray column. And then the darker column is the in-hospital mortality. And then they looked at patients that came in with initial lactate of less than two, 2.1 to 3.9, and then more than four. And as you can see, if, you're, if the patient's lactate uh, is less than two, their mortality is much lower than if it is between two and 3.9 or if it is higher than four. So that's something that you know, we, we're, we're all aware of. Uh, lactate is a pretty good prognostic uh, factor in patients with sepsis and septic shock. 
However, it, it also has a diagnostic value. As I mentioned earlier, this is part of the way with which we define a septic shock. So it's a good prognostic uh, uh, element. It's a diagnostic, it has diagnostic value. And the third point is that lactate measurement over time, uh, or what we call the lactate clearance, can also be used to guide uh, therapy. I'm going to show you some uh, some data on that. Um, so this is uh, this is a study that looked at 348 patients, and they looked at lactate uh, clearance of 20% over two hours. So basically, they used lactate as their target for uh, resuscitation. And as you can see uh, in this, uh, you know, in this diagram on the y-axis is the hospital survival, and then uh, this is over time. The patients uh, were uh, lactate was used as a target, so this is a lactate clearance. They had a higher survival uh, compared to the patients uh, that were uh, in uh, control. However, uh, having having said that, there's uh, quite a few caveats to following lactate uh, levels. Uh, when we use lactate clearance, we're assuming that the changes in lactate levels over time are due to just changes in production of lactic acid. However, that is not always true. In patients with sepsis, even with normal LFTs, lactic oxidation and metabolism can be reduced. So lactate levels and lactate clearance can be altered because a, re a reduction in metabolism. Uh, similarly, in sepsis, metabolic changes, and not just hypoxic changes or due to poor perfusion, can increase lactic acid production. So either endogenous or ex exogenous catecholamines, uh, especially uh, epinephrine, they increase uh, aerobic glycolysis, they uh, increase uh, sodium potassium ATPase, which ultimately leads to lactic acid uh, production. There's insulin resistance and uh, muscle breakdown, both of which lead to pyruvate, and pyruvate is ultimately metabolized into lactic acid. And similarly, there's impairment of a part of a dehydrogenase, which also increases lactic acid levels. So here, my point is, it's not always the production uh, of lactic acid due to hypoperfusion or ischemia that's driving this. There's also changes in metabolism of lactic acid. There's also changes at the level at the level of the mitochondria that can uh, increase lactic acid. And because of that, just purely following lactic acid. Uh, as a target um, is, uh, according now to the guidelines, um, it's a weak recommendation with a low quality of evidence. So just kind of keep that in mind and that not every time we see lactic acid that's, you know, heading in the wrong direction, we're going to assume that, uh, you know, we're going to use that for our resuscitation, but just being aware that other things can be playing a role. The The... Is, um, next part I'm going to talk about is antibiotics, and the guidelines are pretty clear. We need to give antibiotics in a timely fashion, and we need to uh, uh, choose the right or the appropriate antibiotics for our patients. Now, as far as the you know first aspect, which is the timely administration of antibiotics, I'm showing you here Levy and colleagues that looked at a large database, over 28,000 patients, and they looked at the mortality. This is on the y-axis. On the x-axis, you can see the time to first antibiotics. So uh, less than an hour, one to two, two to three, three to four. As you can see, the trend is pretty clear. The 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 you know the, the wider the delay in giving antibiotics, the higher the uh, mortality of patients. Having said that, I think it's important to differentiate patients with sepsis versus patients with septic shock. As I kind of mentioned earlier, uh, both have high mortality, but the mortality difference uh, is, is significant. So what they did in, in this uh, study is they looked at three large databases. So the state of New York, uh, Kaiser on the West Coast, and then Utah Healthcare System. And uh, all of these registries, they have you know, anywhere from 10 to almost 50,000 patients. And they looked at the odds of mortality after an additional hour uh, in giving antibiotics from the ED uh, to the administration. So the odds of mortality, as you can see when we compare sepsis versus septic shock, uh, is different. So the odds of mortality after an additional hour is 1.01 for patients with sepsis. It's 1.04 in patients with septic shock. And you can see the same trend in, in the second registry, 1.04 versus 
and then in the Utah Registry 1.09 versus 1.13. So uh, this kind of makes us think just a little bit differently when we give antibiotics to patients with sepsis and septic shock. This was made clear in the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. Giving antibiotics is a strong recommendation. There is no doubt about that. But as I just showed you, administering uh, antibiotics immediately and within uh, one hour should be done in all patients with potential septic shock. However, for patients with possible sepsis, so not septic shock, you can start with a rapid assessment of infectious and non-infectious causes, and then antibiotics can be given within three hours, uh, whether you know we think that this is uh, sepsis and an infection or not. So there's a little bit of uh, there's a little bit of time that is given for patients with sepsis, whereby the initial workup can happen, and then the window for giving antibiotics is within three hours, versus patients that come in with septic shock, where these should be given antibiotics within an hour. Um, the second aspect of giving antibiotics, as I said, is not just the timing, it's also the appropriateness of, uh, of antibiotics. So here, uh, taking into consideration things like patient's history, comorbidities, uh, if they have known immune deficiencies, suspected site of infection, whether they have invasive devices, and then the local uh, prevalence. Uh, I'm going to uh, just end that section on the timing with, with you know, this is what uh, we anticipate happens in in uh, in our ICU, probably in you know in your ICU as well. So the time frame of a typical uh, admission uh, for a patient coming in with septic shock is, let's say they come in, their you know, septic shock is uh, identified. Uh, oftentimes we give fluids first, 30 minutes. They need a central line, takes 30 minutes. Uh, many of these patients need to be intubated. That's another 30 minutes. You know, you're, we write the orders, they go to the pharmacist, they are, they are processed, they come back to the unit, and then the patient gets them. If we were to actually, uh, you know, uh, add, add these up, it can take up to four hours from the time the patient comes in to the time the patient gets the antibiotics. So just kind of being aware uh, uh, how tedious the process, uh, the process is. The uh, second uh, the, or the next uh, aspect of uh, therapy is, is, is going to be fluid therapy. So for patients with hemodynamic instability, that means systolic blood pressure of less than 80 or a MAP that's less than 70 or a decrease in systolic blood pressure of over 40 points from baseline or in patients who have an elevated lactate of more than four, then these patients should be given fluids 30 mLs per kilogram of ideal body weight and that should be within the first hour. Uh, now, this used to be a strong recommendation, and now it's a, um, it's a weak recommendation with a low level of evidence. And uh, I'm going to show you some data on that. I'm going to just start by saying, you know, the, the 30 mLs per kilogram is based on pediatrics data, kind of older data. It's, uh, uh, it's a little bit difficult to think of giving fluids based on, on body weight. Uh, so that's just one of the, one of the caveats of uh, of um, of this recommendation but more importantly you know when we're thinking of giving fluids these are the things that we're assuming and these are the things that we want to achieve so first off we're assuming that the patient is hypovolemic and sometimes they are they can have nausea and vomiting they can have diarrhea they can have poor po intake so they could have absolute volume uh, losses um, and as such they might respond to fluid therapy Second thing is that we're assuming that the fluid that we're giving to that patient is going to increase the cardiac output and improve organ perfusion. So this is, you know, kind of our, uh, you know, if we go back to our, to our, you know, to school, this is our typical Frank Starling curve, right? We increase the, uh, you know, venous return, we we improve uh, stroke volume and cardiac output. This is what we're trying to achieve when we give patients fluids. And the third point is that oftentimes when we see lactic acidosis, we're assuming hypoperfusion. However, that's not always the case. This is uh, one meta-analysis that looked at a number of studies uh, where they gave patients, uh, where they did the fluid challenge, and then they looked at how many of these patients were fluid responders or fluid responsive patients. And as you can see, on average, uh, almost half of the patients only were fluid responsive. So not all of the patients that we get are gonna be fluid responsive, and that's important to be aware of. The other thing is that fluid overload is common in patients with sepsis. This is Kolm and colleagues. I looked at 
patients uh, uh, up in Mayo. They had over 400 patients that came in with sepsis or septic shock. They were treated according to the surviving sepsis campaign. At day one, two-thirds of the patients had evidence of fluid overload. By day three, almost half of the patients still had evidence of uh, fluid overload. And it's not, just, it's not just that the fluid overload is common. Fluid overload is associated with worse outcomes. And again, this is what they found in their, in their study uh, as well. So having put these kind of into, into perspective, uh, what is the evidence behind fluid therapy? I'm going to go over a few, a few studies that looked at that, and uh, we can kind of you know, uh, make our own uh, conclusions. This is the FEAST trial. This is the fluid expansion as supportive therapy. This is a multi-center trial uh, that looked at giving uh, fluids early on. And they looked at the mortality after a fluid bolus. This was done in, in Africa. And uh, these were patients that came in with uh, febrile illness and signs of uh, impaired perfusion. They recruited uh, around, they were, uh, they recruited around 3,000 patients, although they were planning for around 3,600. And that's because their interim analysis showed that there's a significant uh, difference between these three groups. So they uh, randomized them to 4% uh, albumin, normal saline, or no bolus. And otherwise, everything else was the same. And what they found was a little bit shocking. The, this is the mortality on the y-axis. This is over time. The patients that had no, uh, no bolus, so this is the bottom curve, these were the patients that did best. So a little bit counterintuitive to what we think. This is another uh, study. Uh, this is a, uh, a trial over 200 patients that came in with sepsis and hypotension. Um, and uh, what they did is they randomized them into what they call the sepsis protocol. These are patients that got two liters of bolus of uh, normal saline within first hour of enrollment. And then if they felt they needed more fluids, they gave them another two over the next uh, four hours. And then usual care is you know, up to the uh, you know, primary team to decide on how they want to give fluids. They also excluded patients that came in hypoxic, tachypneic, in heart failure, or uh, with the end-stage renal disease, because they wanted to just ensure that uh, to start with, these were not patients uh, that had uh, some uh, degree of fluid overload. Um, these are you know, the preliminary data from that study. Three and a half years uh, is what the sepsis protocol patients received in the first six hours. They got the four liters within 24 hours. Usual care, as you can see, they received less, so two liters in the first six hours and then three. Interestingly, patients who uh, got more fluids ended up needing more vasopressors. So 14.2% versus 1.9%. Blood transfusion was the same. Time to antibiotics was just a little bit uh, longer, two versus one and a half um, uh, hour, which is not surprising. But more importantly, when we look at uh, um, uh, outcomes, mortality for patients that were randomized to the sepsis protocol, these are the ones that got you know, more fluids up front. Their mortality was 48%. Patients that were randomized to usual care, which got less fluids, their mortality was lower. And then they looked at some other parameters just to reflect uh, maybe pulmonary edema, if patients became more uh, tachypneic or if they became more hypoxic and uh, Perhaps not surprisingly, the patients that were in the sepsis uh, group, uh, they did uh, they did the worse from that perspective. And again, this is a you know, Kaplan-Meier uh, curve. This is a survival curve. As you can see, patients who were in the sepsis protocol, so these are the ones that got more fluids up front. Their survival was lower compared to the usual uh, care. This is another study. This is the classic trial, conservative versus liberal approach to fluid therapy for patients in uh, septic shock. 151 patients with septic shock on presses for less than 12 hours. They were randomized after 30 ml. So some of the earlier other studies were the bolus. Now this is looking at uh, fluids after patients received the 30 ml. Um, um, and then they looked at, and then there's the one that were fluid restricted, where they only gave fluids if they had severe uh, hyperperfusion signs. So lactate more than four. MAP less than 50, they had modeling of the skin if they were oliguric. And uh, in these fluid-restricted uh, patients, they got fluid boluses of just 250 to uh, 500 mLs. 
And these are the uh, outcomes. Uh, what favors fluid restriction? So, you know, giving less fluids, the 250 to 500 bolus, as you can see, almost all of them, whether it's death by at 90 days, ischemic events in the ICU or worsening of the AKI, they were all in, in favor of uh, fluid restriction. So, again, uh, signaling that less fluids is perhaps better than uh, more fluids. Now, the same group, uh, uh, you know, went back and they did the, the same study. Uh, this time they had uh, over 1,500 patients. So again, this is the classic. Now this is trial two. Uh, this was their second uh, trial, uh, larger patient population. And again, there, there's the restrictive uh, group and then the standard fluid uh, group. Um, they sh I'm showing you here the IV fluid volume, which is how much they were given. The total fluid volume, which is the, uh, the one in the middle, is how much they got as far as IV fluids plus other infusions they were getting. And then the cumulative fluid balance is uh, basically when they took everything that came in and everything that came out. So this was this is kind of their net uh, I, you know, eyes and nose. So they took into consideration their urine output, if they had GI losses and others. So this is the balance. And um, they looked at Again, outcome. Now, surprisingly here, uh, patients who were, uh, whether they were in the restricted fluid group or the standard fluid group, the survival was pretty much the same. As you can see, the, the two curves are overlapping. And then when they did their, their you know, secondary analysis, uh, it was pretty much uh, almost equal between the two groups. However, I want to go back to that slide and just show you some differences. This study, uh, you know, was published just, uh, you know, less than a year ago. And uh, here in the restrictive fluid uh, group, as you can see, the differences between uh, that and the standard fluid therapy is small. So here the mean is around a liter. Here is a liter 0.7. This is after one day. Total fluid volume is 2.3 versus 3. And then when you look at the cumulative fluid balance after day one, is 1.1 versus 1. almost 7. So even in the standard fluid therapy uh, group, the fluids that they were getting were, I would say, almost restricted. So although this study didn't show that restrictive fluid therapy was better, I think what it also showed is that overall the practice has changed. And in general, even uh, if we're not told that we should restrict fluids, we are being more cautious in giving fluids to patients with uh, septic shock. Now you might you know, ask, how could uh, fluids be harmful in uh, sepsis or septic shock? And these are, you know, these are the kind of thoughts behind that. Uh, in general, sepsis is not a volume depleted state. The main pathology of sepsis is vasoplegia. So it's vasodilation. There's also microvascular dysfunction and endothelial dysfunction and capillary leak. And uh, when we give fluids to these patients, uh, this is exacerbated. And it's thought to be that this is, causes what we call a reperfusion injury uh, to, to these patients. There's also some uh, thought uh, that giving a fluid bolus uh, actually induces vasodilation. And that's because it blunts the stress response to shock. It attenuates the better reflex, uh, reflex mediated vasoconstriction. It increases the stress on the endothelium, causing relaxation. And it leads to the release of uh, nutriuretic peptides, which also uh, uh, you know, cause vasodilation. So these are, are some, of the, uh, some of the reasons why uh, fluids could be harmful in, in these patients. There's also, uh, you know, the recognition that some patients develop sepsis-induced uh, cardiomyopathy. So, uh, the, you know, the common name is Takotsubo the, uh, that, uh, you know, we oftentimes use. Sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy is found to in up to 46% of patients, and it can manifest in a few different ways. Takotsubo is this apical ballooning of the left ventricle. There's also other descriptions of global ventricular dysfunction. There's a dilation of the ventricle. There's also a description of a diastolic dysfunction and not just systolic dysfunction. And this is unrelated to uh, cardiac ischemia. So if these patients were to get an angiogram, uh, uh, this dysfunction would not be due to uh, obstruction. So when, when we do give uh, fluids, when, when should we consider giving uh, patients fluids? Uh, 
So, um, so first off, not all patients are fluid responsive, as I as I mentioned. The the best tools that we have are using dynamic predictors of fluid responsiveness to distinguish between patients who could benefit from fluid expansion, and in those where fluid therapy might lead to fluid overload and uh, and can be harmful. So dynamic predictors are things like pulse pressure uh, variation um, or things like uh, changes in uh, stroke volume um, or uh, arterial waveform changes. So there, there's a few uh, parameters uh, that can be used that take advantage of the fact that thoracic pressure changes during uh, respiration uh, and usually within positive pressure if the patient is intubated. And these variations, so these dynamic changes that are seen with cardiac output uh, can be used to predict fluid responsiveness. IVC variation in patients that are intubated is another example. So uh, that's so far the best tool that we have uh, to help with uh, fluid resuscitation. As I mentioned, uh, the 30 mLs per kilogram of ideal body weight um, is uh, based on Older data, pediatrics data, it's unclear why we would be giving fluids to patients based on, on body weight. However, it is part of uh, expectations from CMS, so I, I think we invariably do it. Uh, but uh, it's just something to, to be aware of that, uh, you know, down the line, this might, uh, this might no longer uh, apply. When we do decide to give fluids, uh, which fluids should we give? So isotonic saline uh, or normal saline is the most commonly used crystalloid. However, there has been observational and retrospective data uh, that uh, suggesting lower mortality in patients when they receive uh, balanced uh, fluids. So things like lactated ringer instead of normal saline. So I'm going to go over uh, that data. The, the most popular one is the SMART trial that was published a few years ago. Uh, this is a, a large a trial that had uh, over 15,000 patients. It was done at, at Alabama, and they looked at balanced crystalloids uh, versus normal saline. And um, interesting thing here is that their outcome was what we call a, uh, so, so this outcome was a make 30, which is a, it's a composite outcome in the sense that they didn't look just at death or new renal replacement therapy or refining creatinine uh, double than the baseline, they looked at all three together as a single uh, outcome. And uh, this was the this is the result of their trial. So again, uh, balanced uh, versus normal saline, and then the, this is a make 30. Again, this is based on these three things: 30-day in hospital mortality, the need for renal replacement therapy, and the final creatinine being double the baseline. Now, interestingly, each one of these did not reach statistical significance. So they were not significant, each uh, you know, one of them. However, when you combine all three together, then the MIG-30 becomes significant. And uh, based on this, it looks like balanced uh, fluids were, uh, were better than uh, just normal saline. When they, um, so, so again, now this trial, as I already mentioned, it was a single center trial. The, the outcome that they looked at is a composite outcome, uh, which is, you know, which comes with, uh, with its own limitations. However, this study, you know, put lactated ringer kind of on the market or kind of made it more popular, you know, to be used. However, there's been subsequent trial, uh, trials that did not confirm uh, these observations. Um, uh, this, uh, this is, uh, this, uh, dub this is a, uh, uh, Controlled, randomized controlled trial that looked at saline versus balanced solution. Uh, again, uh, in patients that were uh, in the ICU, they looked at mortality. As you can see here, the, the two uh, curves, they pretty much overlap. So there was no uh, advantage for using balanced solution uh, versus saline solution. This was a pretty large study, almost 10,000 patients. Another study that was uh, also a fairly recent study um, this one was done in uh, Australia and New Zealand. This is the PLUS trial. Again, they looked at the balanced solution versus saline uh, in patients in the ICU. Again, I'm showing you here the Kaplan-Meier curve. And as you can see, the two curves, they pretty much uh, overlap. So despite the, you know, the excitement that we initially had with, with the SMART trial, the basic trial, and then this trial, the PLUS trial, 
did not show an advantage of of balanced solution to uh, to just uh, saline. So, what do the guidelines then uh, say when you want to give fluids? Which fluid should we give? For adults with the sepsis or septic shock, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign recommends using crystalloids as a first-line uh, therapy if, uh, for resuscitation. This is a strong recommendation with moderate quality of evidence. So crystalloids in general. However, for adults with sepsis or septic shock, the, camp, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign suggests using balanced crystalloids instead of normal saline. However, this is a weak recommendation with a low quality of evidence. So we should be using crystalloids as opposed to colloids, which is albumin. Um, and then within crystalloids, uh, you know, the recommendation to use balanced crystalloids, which is LR, is weak with the low quality of evidence. So uh, our practice uh, here is to, I'm going to say maybe almost mix and match. So oftentimes we start off with the saline, but usually if the patient becomes hyperchloremic or if they develop an anion gap or a non-anion gap acidosis from the normal saline, then we switch to a lactated drinker. Or if there's a reason to use lactated drinker, you know, upfront, we might do that. But oftentimes we try and, and use a little bit of both, except if we have a strong uh, indication to use one. But again, uh, so far you can use crystalloids, normal saline, or LR. Uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can choose either one of them. Now the, the the last arm is uh, the you know guidelines for vasopressors. So norepinephrine or levofed is the first uh, choice. Adding um, vasopressin when a second agent is needed. If norepinephrine is not available, epinephrine or dopamine uh, can be used. There's pretty good evidence for epinephrine kind of head to head with norepinephrine. Uh, or even epinephrine head-to-head -head with norepinephrine and, and dobutamine. So that's a pretty good agent as well. Uh, dopamine increases the risk of arrhythmias, uh, uh, AFib, especially in patients with heart failure. So uh, we tend to avoid using dopamine, um, except if the patient uh, has a bradycardia, and just, just because we know that dopamine can increase the heart rate. So otherwise, we tend to uh, avoid using dopamine. If the patient has persistent hyperperfusion despite fluids and vasopressors, then we can use ionotropes, so agents like dobutamine that increase myocardial contractility. There's other agents that are mentioned, but there's no recommendation to use them. Uh, Celepressin, terlipressin, angiotensin II. Um, there's you know, data coming out on these agents, but currently they are not part of our, um, you know, of our agents to use. I mentioned that earlier, uh, when we do use uh, vasopressors, uh, oftentimes we tend to uh, we tend to use vasopressors after uh, our fluid resuscitation if the patient is still in shock or hypotensive. However, I want to uh, show this uh, study. They uh, just because it makes us think a little bit differently. Uh, this is the sensor trial. They looked at over 300 patients that came in with sepsis and hypotension. And what they did is they said, we're going to start norepinephrine early. Uh, so this is the early norepinephrine effusion group versus the standard uh, care. And the median time from the ER to norepinephrine infusion was an hour and a half in the early norepinephrine group versus uh, almost uh, three hours in the uh, standard care, which is not surprising. Oftentimes, the patient comes into the ED, you know, they get fluids, they're getting lined, all that stuff. It does take time and you know, they're getting their fluid. And um, so in this study, they kind of made it a point to try and start norepinephrine early, and they did I mean, within 90 minutes. Now, if you look at, uh, you know, the results of the study, shock control um, by six hours was much higher in the uh, patient population where they used epinephrine early, 76 versus 48%. However, they also had other interesting uh, um, data points as well. The early norepinephrine group had lower cardiogenic pulmonary edema, almost half, and they had a lower uh, incidence of new onset arrhythmia, uh, almost half as well. So saying norepinephrine, uh, at least based on, on this trial, uh, seems to be safe and actually seems to improve uh, outcomes uh, as well. And this is uh, why, or this is one of the studies uh, that the surviving sepsis campaign used to saying that or vasopressors can be used either during fluid resuscitation 
or at the end of fluid resuscitation, which is what I highlighted uh, earlier uh, in, uh, in my talk. Now, one of the reasons why uh, we tend to delay uh, studying vasopressors is because we're worried about, uh, uh, about access, right? So oftentimes we're thinking the patient doesn't have a central line, the patient might not need a central line, so, so what do we do? However, there's more recent data that shows that uh, peripheral access can be used for a certain amount of time uh, for uh, vasopressor infusion and is fairly safe. Here in this um, study, they give uh, patients uh, either uh, through uh, vasopressors, either through a peripheral axis or a central axis, and then they looked at the number of local tissue uh, events, so less than one hour, one to two, two to three, three to four, and then more than 24. And uh, what they found was that uh, early on, especially, you know, almost 12 up to 24 hours, uh, the uh, incidence of um, local tissue uh, injury is actually pretty low. And when they did have some uh, injury, it was pretty mild. Um, um, for more than 24 hours, the incidence of uh, local tissue events with peripheral infusion becomes much higher. So what they recommended based on this was that um, yeah, you know, peripheral access can be used for vasopressors, um, especially if it's uh, for a short amount of time. So usually in our practice here is that uh, norepinephrine can be given up to 24 hours um, in, uh, in patients. There's also uh, the caveat that the infusion rate cannot be high, so there's a cutoff that we use whereby we need to switch uh, to, um, uh, to a central line, and we cannot have more than one uh, presser running at the same time. Um, there's also uh, data that more distal uh, peripherals uh, tend to have a higher rate of extravasation and injury than more proximal. There's also the size of the peripheral IV that can be used, whereby larger cannulas have a uh, lower incidence of extravasation. So just kind of thinking of, of that uh, as a way to facilitate uh, early vasopressors and not kind of you know having to uh, you know start thinking of. Uh, you know, central line as being an obstacle uh, to uh, to vasopressors. Now, when when we're giving fluids or when we are uh, using vasopressors, um, what's our what's our map target that we're using? The the biggest trial that we have is uh, called the sepsis PAM trial. This is a French study. They looked at. Uh, uh, patients in uh, septic shock, and they divided them into the low uh, or the high target group. The low target was 65 to 70. The high target was around 80 for a map. And as you can see, there's pretty much uh, no difference in the survival between, uh, between these two. So the higher target uh, patients did not do better than the patients with you know, just a map of 65. In fact, in this study, the patients that were in the higher target group had the higher incidence of arrhythmias, uh, including including AFib. There's another uh, trial. This is Amontagne and colleagues, uh, also a French uh, study. They looked at um, 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 a map of 65. Actually, here they used 60 to 65, so they called this permissive hypotension. They also uh, used patients that were above 65, and this is because uh, um, these are the uh, higher risk uh, patients that we have. And this was a pretty large study, 2,600 uh, 2, patients. And the mortality for uh, usual care versus permissive hypotension, although it looks like actually these patients had a slightly lower mortality, the permissive hypotension, uh, uh, although statistically this was not significant. Uh, but again, um, uh, a map of 60-65 uh, in these patients uh, had similar outcomes uh, as uh, usual care, also making us think that oh, maybe 60-65 is actually, uh, you know, is, is as good as other targets. Um, and kind of moves us away from uh, trying to reach uh, higher MAP targets. So 65, uh, based on these two, two studies, uh, seems to be a pretty reasonable uh, target. So uh, what do uh, so what does the you know the, the campaign uh, say? Uh, 
for adults with septic shock on vasopressors. The surviving sepsis campaign recommends an initial target of 65 over higher MAP targets. And this is uh, based on, uh, this is a strong recommendation with a moderate quality uh, evidence. And uh, just kind of some, some final thoughts to uh, uh, kind of close it down. Sepsis, um, uh, major things are early detection, institution of antibiotics. Uh, lactic acidosis does not necessarily mean hypoperfusion and the need for more fluids. In fact, only about half of our patients are fluid responsive. On the other hand, fluid overload is common among septic patients and is associated with worse outcomes. There is evidence for a restrictive fluid strategy with early use of uh, vasopressors or norepinephrine. So far, there is no evidence that balanced solutions like lactate drinker are superior to normal saline. And the target uh, map uh, so far is, uh, from all the data that we have, is at 65. With that, I'll uh, close here and happy to take questions. Uh, thanks for a very good talk. I'm a neurologist, and so I see a lot of patients after their sepsis who have an encephalopathy. Could you uh, explain a little bit more what you think the causes of the encephalopathy are? I see a lot of people who are elderly who either have a Parkinsonian syndrome or an early dementia who seem to have much worse outcomes after a septic encephalopathy. So again, what are some of the main causes and do you see a difference also in, in the uh, patients who have a, already are susceptible either from a dementia or Parkinson's standpoint? Yeah, that's a great point. So, so um, sepsis, uh, induced encephalopathy is is a, is a known entity, and that's thought to be part of the uh, part of the inflammatory picture that these patients develop. And I think, like like you highlighted, uh, these patients, uh, especially elderly patients who at baseline have poor functional status, whether it's from dementia or Parkinson's, they 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 do worse. I'm not sure if there's uh, something. Sp you know, specific other than just maybe poor recovery or um, um, or uh, if there's an, another pathway. But I would agree with your observation that uh, these patients are higher risk and they tend to do worse. And to start with, they have poor reserves, so their recovery tends to take time. I mean, it, it's, uh, we don't have a, a, um, a post ICU care clinic, but a lot of the things that we do do leave an impact on our patients. Whether it's mechanical intubation, uh, mechanical ventilation, and vehicular intubation, um, um, impact on lung function tests down the line. There's also uh, data on uh, cognitive dysfunction um, uh, after. Uh, recovery and after an ICU stay. So this post ICU syndrome or, uh, uh, you know, these complications are um, are known, uh, but there is still, I think, an active, uh, it's still an active uh, field uh, for, for research. We've actually, we've been uh, thinking of having uh, our own like post ICU clinic uh, here just because of the recognition that of that problem that you that you've mentioned. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any other questions, so thank you very much. Thank you.